I feel a little bit awkward because I think that probably most of you were in chapel and heard this introduction already. I don't feel awkward about talking about Duncan a second time because I'm very enthusiastic about him being here with us and want to thank you again for a wonderful chapel talk this morning. Lots to think about. And he mentioned that this afternoon's is a little bit more academic, a little more about Northern Ireland. So I won't, since we're starting a little bit late and I don't want to take away too much time from Duncan, I won't repeat the entire introduction that I did today, but I'll repeat some relevant portions. Duncan was raised in an ecumenical community surrounded by people of great faith, great intellect, and great energy. And while most of his peers in Northern Ireland were raised without having any substantive interaction with people unlike themselves, Duncan grew up reading and studying and interacting with some of the great peace builders of Northern Ireland. He spent years in intensive study with a group of, of other people interested in peace in what they informally called the mill group, I think because they met in an old mill is that correct? The Mill Group? Anyway, they studied the works and the implications of René Girard's thinking. He also formed a deep appreciation for Donald Shriver, a political scientist, in his work on political forgiveness and ethic for enemies. He's very well read. He spent so much time at Corrymeela, both growing up with his father, who was a, a director at Corrymeela, a reconciliation center, but also then as an adult making the commitment to become a member of the community and helping to sustain that, that place and the, the community. So given where he lived and the ideas that he regularly entertained, it's not surprising that he went on to earn a bachelor and a doctoral degree in philosophy, politics, and economics, first from Queens College, Oxford, and then from Edinburgh University, where his mother is from. He immersed himself not merely in the abstract world of the ivory tower, however, but also in the day-to-day -day life in his own troubled and divided home of Northern Ireland and Belfast in particular. His early university work and his research on churches and inter-community relations and the book that resulted from that landed him the appointment in 1998 as a sentence review commissioner, which was the body responsible for implementing the early release of paramilitary prisoners under the Good Friday Agreement. He later spent almost a decade as head of the Community Relations Council, where he implemented, oversaw, and initiated programs designed to build integrated programs, integrated structures, and integrated schools. And that was an adjustment for me, because here in the United States, when we talk about mixed marriages and integrated schools, we think of race relations, especially between black and white. But in Northern Ireland, that would be the divide between Protestant and Catholic. Many of those programs were designed to mediate difficult conversations, ethnic conflict, recreational rioting, and the ongoing sectarian violence and territorial disputes. He served as an advisor for the Strategic Review Group for Parades and continues to work as a parole commissioner. Currently, he's a lecturer in politics, criminology, and social policy at the University of Ulster, where he also directs the Center for Communities and Conflict. He's a unique individual, someone born into the troubles, yet also born into a faithful, scholarly, activist, ecumenical community. Someone highly educated and well-published, yet also grounded in the everyday disputes and violence in a divided society. He's someone committed to peaceful and sustainable living, but also regularly engaged with violent criminals. So please join me in extending a warm welcome for Duncan Morrow, who will be speaking, sorry. <laughs> I screwed that up. I hope none of my public speaking students are here. <laughs> He's speaking, and if you wrong us, shall we not revenge from the Merchant of Venice? Reflections on revenge, reconciliation, and resentment in Northern Ireland. One more time, Duncan Morrow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Deborah. My uh, father was a very wise man, and his instruction to me on hearing those things was always, never inhale. <laughs> but thank you very much indeed, very gracious words. And I am personally delighted to have been invited by Deborah and, and by the team here to come and speak here. It's a huge honour for me and just even being here and listening to some of the talks yesterday and the talks today reminds me of just how much actually, from my point of view, the liberal arts tradition in America has fostered a real sense of conversation which at times is missing, I think, in European academics. 
and I want to thank you for it. And I think the commitment to human improvement which lies behind it and the kind of value-driven approach that it embodies is something we still could learn from. Now, I have my timekeepers up in the back here, so I have to watch my time. And I will start now. So here we go, 45 minutes. <laughs> <coughs> Northern Ireland is not poor by uh, global standards, nor are we badly educated, nor do we live in a part of the world where capitalist private property or democratic norms are late arrivals. I say that to challenge those of you who suppose that conflict can be explained or sorted out by simple reference to wealth and income or by ignorance or by pre-modern relations of property and democracy. Indeed, we have at least an arguable case that Northern Ireland is the centre of the world when it comes to democracy, <laughs> in as far as we are as close to the middle of the democratic ocean between America and Britain and France, not far away. The first US consulate in the world after the revolution was opened in Belfast. And at the same time, I want to say that all of these things, wealth and access to employment, education and its control, and questions of land ownership, equality and democracy have all played a part in the narrative of conflict which has defined Northern Ireland since 1920 and indeed in the social relationships which emerged in the north of Ireland and there's a language thing there between Northern Ireland and the north of Ireland for decades, even centuries before. But if we are to understand them, we have to understand the relationship of intimate rivalry within which they alone have real meaning. The crisis is not in the objects, it is in the relationships. Northern Ireland can make no claim to being the most violent or the most significant conflict. Indeed, its primary value for those of us who wish to learn about violence may lay precisely in its status as a contained conflict in a context of Western European levels of expectation and management. The fact that it has not yet finally polarised to the logical extreme results in the visibility of recognisable patterns of violent relationship, which are often invisible in conflicts where the escalation of conflict destroys everything and everyone in its path. From this point of view, Northern Ireland functions not so much as an example as a laboratory of both conflict and at Western attempts to find ways out. And it is in this spirit that I will try to explore with you not only what happened in the particular but what light it throws on more abstract ideas of educated liber liberal thinking, which always appear to me to run the risk of understanding events and objects as self-evident, while failing to understand how they are transformed under conditions of fear and threat. Violence and our fascination with violence defines what we see and what we considerable, consider reasonable. In this telling, reason can never be fully separated from interests. The truth is that violence is not so much an outcome of human relatedness and therefore a problem, a noun to be solved, but a determinant of them, a reality, a verb which we look to transform. Violence is both enormously attractive and horrifically destructive and repellent. Either way, it is profoundly fascinating. Some 500 years before Christ, Heraclitus declared violence to be the father of all things. The logos, the defining pattern, the logic, the final word of human affairs is violence. Even power decorated by legitimacy rests on force. For some, like Confucius or Plato or Hobbes, the risk of uncontrolled violent frenzy provides the grounds for conformity with limited and ordered violence law and order as the only available basis for social harmony. Nietzsche, on the other hand, worshipped its potential to define human affairs and the superhumans who made them through their will to power, exemplified by Dionysus. The assertion of both Heraclitus and Nietzsche is that we reason from within our appetites for power rather than the other way around. When Mao announced that all power comes from the barrel of a gun, and remarked that war is the highest form of struggle for resolving contradictions when they have developed to a certain stage between classes, nations, states, or political group. And it has existed ever since the emergence of private property and of classes. 
he was, to all intents and purposes, re-quoting Heraclitus. This is profoundly important for how we approach violence and the question of peace. On one level, violence is an it which has to be managed and controlled. Peace is the establishment of a social order which is guaranteed by an effective framework of law, order and enforcement and the agreed application of necessary minimal violence. In our modern world, however, the reliance of order itself on that violence has become increasingly problematic and we are forced to confront the question we would all like to avoid. How can relationships built on power give way to relationships which make room for recognition, recognition, reciprocal generosity, and free existence. The former has usually been the province of philosophy, military calculus, and politics of the real world, if you like. And the latter has been the province of religion, both more ultimate and more marginal in this world. One of the most startling analyses of this dilemma, and I talked a little bit about this this morning, is articulated in the very beginning of the Gospel of John. John's remarkable claim is that the ultimate logos is not violence, but love. Furthermore, because it is so radically other than violent, it is violently resisted. In the beginning was the word, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John concludes, however, that this peace is only known in the world through incarnation. Peace must be made manifest and emulated. Peace, in this sense, is not measured in the absence of violence, but as a possibility which is brought into being in verbs like following, leading, serving, and loving. Peace is not finally to be found in political order, although Caesar is not unimportant and the Torah stands at the threshold but in the transformation of relationships of resentment and revenge into a new community of reconciliation, which is not magic, but it is profoundly miraculous. This is the effect not only of Jesus, but of the Martin Luther Kings, the Mandelas and the Gandhis, and of moments such as Willy Brandt's falling to his knees at Auschwitz and the Sadat's visit to the Knesset. In these moments, new relationships thought impossible, forehand, thought impossible beforehand come into being, and the way in which we see each other is transformed. Creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing, the very definition of creation, or as John would have it, without him nothing was made that has been made. In talking about violence, war, and peace, is Heraclitus correct when he concludes that violence is definitive in human affairs? and we should limit our horizon to finding an acceptable order? Should we confine ourselves to, and can we rely on, seeking a political formula of checks, balances, and deals which distributes power in such a way as to hold random violence in check? Or, if we want peace, should our focus now be on establishing relationships of humanity, which alone hold out the promise of a world beyond vigilance and suspicion? Of course, in the real world, these questions have never been either or. The case of Northern Ireland, however, illustrates that all the efforts to find a political solution cannot be separated from the waiting for a change of heart. As the Irish Nobel laureate poet Seamus Heaney put it in The Cure at Troy, a poem that has become it's so incisive that it has now become a cliché, and he wrote, Human beings suffer. They torture one another. They get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right a wrong, inflicted or endured. The innocent in jails beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. A police widow in veils faints at the funeral home. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. 
Northern Ireland may be instructive for the rest of you because as technology develops and as we know more and more about the violence that even the best of us are capable of, the instruments of war have we, as we have known them globally are becoming less and less effective in their capacity to achieve their promised change and establish peace. We may increasingly have no alternative but to seek a different kind of peace. And the decisive question, whether Heraclitus or John is correct about the nature of human affairs, may be becoming more and more immediate. I want to turn now to the specific experience of Northern Ireland. Surprisingly, perhaps, modern politics in Ireland were shaped by the same broad movements that shaped the Americas after 1492, and it's not a very long talk. <laughs> the territorial and economic expansion of the Western European empires into every continent. Europe was shaped in imperial competition as first Spain, then Portugal, France, the Netherlands, and then England, later Great Britain, found expansion west and south. The early phase of the expansion was also marked by the breakup of med medieval Christendom and its division into papal loyalists, the Catholics, and challengers, the Protestants, leading to deep theological and political enmity that shaped the experience, fears, and identity of states and sustained violent conflict for centuries. England had the most thorough and least theological reformation of all. Once Henry VIII divorced his Spanish queen, he was set on a religious and political collision course with the other powers of Europe. It also had the effect of turning Catholic loyalists within the realm into potential enemies and pockets of Catholicism into potential launching pads for sedition. Ireland, the ragged, relatively wild western margin of England, English power and interest, represented the greatest risk of all. Now it became a critical English strategic interest to ensure that it did not fall into the wider Catholic sphere. After the launch and failure of the Spanish Armada in 1588, we're moving quickly, <laughs> English paranoia about this real and present danger reached fever pitch, and English determination to bring Ireland under control between, became increasingly more urgent. What was in London a strategic political necessity was also in practice a systemic assault on the Gaelic culture of Ireland. Ultimately, in 1603, the Gaelic families of the northwest of Ireland, at the wildest of the wildest frontiers, determined to resist. Inevitably, they sought military support against England from England's continental enemies. The die was cast. The alignment of Ireland, Catholicism and rebellion and resistance was made. When in 1608 the Gaelic leadership fled to raise armies in Catholic Europe, the English confiscated their lands and determined to settle them with a new loyal population on the model that was beginning to take root across the Atlantic in Virginia, 1607 Jamestown, 1608 Ireland. In this regard, Northern Ireland and North America share the same fundamental origins in time and method. Political reliability in this case was critically dependent on religion. The badge of loyalty was Protestantism. In this combination, a second faithful, fateful combination was emerging. By identifying Protestantism with loyalty and using this as a vehicle to enforce military economic domination, a fateful integration of religion, politics, economics, and violence took root. There was, however, a crucial difference between the north of Ireland and the eastern seaboard of the Americas. Whereas in Virginia and Massachusetts, the settlers quickly established total domination over the relatively sparsely settled native population, marginalizing their influence over the next centuries through a combination of force of arms and disease, the settlers in Ireland entered a densely populated territory where the descendants of the displaced natives continued to live. Whereas the settlers saw Ireland as a divinely granted opportunity for development and liberty against the backdrop of fanatical and authoritarian Catholic imperialism, the native population saw only occupation, dispossession, and fanatical religious violence. The settlers and natives lived in immediate proximity, sides in a bitter existential struggle in which the settlers, though dominant for as long as they were supported by British power, could not forget that they lived at risk from a constant and real threat of revenge and expulsion, while natives were subjected to the systemic indignities 
of suppression, disdain and poverty. A toxic combination of sectarian rivalry, political loyalty and a deeply asymmetric economic experience. The result was a radical cleft in relationships between neighbours in which the reality and threat of violence remains close and decisive even when the visible level of violence receded. Because the nature of the suspected threat was existential, conspiracy was justified. Indeed, necessity, a necessity. And it necessitated the kind of vigilance and deterrence which reinforced the suspicion among those against whom it was directed. Worse, the, the suspicion could be confirmed through an obsessive concentration on the actions of a few radicals rather than the actions of the moderate majority. Unsurprisingly, the result was, a sporad was sporadic and repeated outbreaks of violence which coalesced into a narrative pattern of historic aggression and resistance which formed the bedrock of community and political identity. All of this predated the rise of democratic politics. The brief emergence of radical Presbyterian republicanism in part of the North, less affected by sectarianism in the light of the American Revolution, faded when revolution in Ireland descended into bitter sectarian reprisal. Increasingly, Protestants in Ireland looked to the union with Great Britain as their military bulwark. The same processes were driving Catholics into basic antipathy to Britain. In spite of Catholic political emancipation in 1829 and the concession of church control of education in 1830, the famine of the 1840s reinforced the sense of land poverty among the emigrants and embedded an abiding bitterness at the failure of the British government to defend the population against starvation and catastrophe. As democracy spread, Catholics were increasingly attracted to varieties of nationalism, some of which, especially in the diaspora, were prepared to contemplate revolutionary violence. In most of Ireland, this led to a clear majority support for Irish nationalism focused on external occupation. But where Protestants and Catholics lived side by side as they did in the Northeast, threat and occupation were also internal. Sectarianism was not eliminated by nationalism and modernization, but further embedded, sharpening a pre-existing rivalry. Instead of assimilation, the rising rivalry threatened to break down any informal networks of neighbors and friends into polar and antagonistic opposites. By the beginning of the 20th century, Protestants and Catholics lived side by side in a political relationship which was inextricably linked with existential and cultural fears and resentment, in a manner which made it impossible to finally distinguish what was the cause and what was the effect. As each group sought political solutions to their predicament through self-assertion, so the anxieties of their opponents grew in a reciprocal process closely resembling the German military theorist Klaus, uh, Karl von Clausewitz's pattern of escalation to the extremes. The crisis came to a head after World War I. In the frenzied atmosphere of national self-assertion and post-war jingoism that affected the whole continent. In his own classic effort to rescue something from the ruins of Armageddon, Woodrow Wilson proposed that the imperial system be replaced by an international system of democratic nation states built on free choice or national self-determination, and America for all. What his system failed to accommodate, however, was the enmity and hostility of nations living in intermingled territories where granting national self-determination to one group inevitably meant the suppression of the other, in the very places where rivalry was most embedded and risks were greatest. In 1922, Kemal Ataturk demonstrated the sheer scale of the risk faced by minorities living in territories claimed by others, when a 5,000-year-old community of Greeks were simply driven from Western Anatolia. In these circumstances, democracy was not a mechanism to engage all in liberty, but was transformed into a head-counting vehicle to decide power in polarized and hostile communities. British territory was not determined by international conference, but the final act of the Irish drama was conducted in its wake. Facing widespread public support for a militant Irish Republic insurgency, British authority in most of Ireland could only be secured, if at all, through the exercise of massive force. At the same time, Unionist domination of the North East could not be prevented unless the British were prepared to prevent it by force. Concluding that nothing could be gained through the further, further use of force, the British government tried to split Ireland into two, 
and offer devolved power to Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland as a mechanism to, sure, to secure unionism in the North and nationalism in the South. When the solution was rejected by nationalists, only the unionist-dominated Northern Ireland was established. Within 12 months, however, the British indicated their willingness to negotiate full independence for the rest, not including Northern Ireland. The result was the division of Ireland into the situation which pertains today, an independent state in the south, centre and west, and devolved British sovereignty in the north, eastern fifth, known as Northern Ireland. Whereas the south of Ireland was dominated by an unusually homogenous Irish Catholic nation, the north was split between its Protestant Unionist defenders and numerous Catholic and nationalist opponents. Theoretically, the existence of Northern Ireland was a triumph for the Protestants, for Unionists. In reality, however, the combined effect of the division of Ireland and the devolution of local power to Belfast allowed the British establishment to lose any sense of residual responsibility. In effect, Northern Ireland contained and limited the worst aspects of British-Irish rivalry into itself and removed them from mainstream British and Irish affairs. Just to ask. Irish conflict is now contained into here, and these people start to walk away. Northern Ireland was effectively more anti-Irish than pro-British. Although procedurally democratic, national antagonism gripped the politics of the new structure, establishing a fundamental relationship of mutual suspicion, crudely defined in informal terms through the proxy of religion, and raising the question of identity with or against the state to a structuring principle of everyday life. The question in Northern Ireland politics is, to be or not to be? That is the question. And it's pretty obsessive when it's asked. Group identity rather than personal citizenship defined political relations. Problematically, violence was not between states, but between peoples in the same state. Although the rivalry was expressed as a battle between constitutional alternatives, the problem of all of the constitutional alternatives was that each model embedded a relation of dominance and resentment and a dynamic of antagonism which no politics of democracy could eliminate. The choices were you rule it or we rule it. But there was nothing which had we all rule it together. Indeed, voting was the mechanism through which fear and resentment were translated into politics, living proof of de Tocqueville's fears about tyranny when all authority originates in the will of the majority. Peace, meaning the absence of violence, was always fragile and always suspicious. While the unionist majority held to absolute distinction between law and force on one side and terror and the violence on the other, many nationalists saw law only as the codified form of unionist violence, and even some even justified violence not as terror, but as the only available form of resistance to prior unionist structural domination. Thus, enforcement brought forth terror, while terror led to demands for enforcement and security in a cycle of injury and recrimination requiring revenge. The realities of institutional politics interacted with personal and community relations, relationships to produce a dynamic where ongoing injury and anxiety in the political sphere fueled resentment and hatred. We might call this antagonism. Catholics say we should never have been divided, we should have already been running this place, so the IRA go. The Protestants say we'll put some laws in here. But Protestants were actually international pioneers. They said we must defend ourselves, we face an existential threat. Normal law will not defend us. And anybody who doesn't understand this is either a traitor or an idiot. <laughs> this is called the Northern Ireland Special Powers. It's now the logic called Homeland Security. <laughs> and it says, we face an existential threat, normal law will not protect us, and anybody who thinks otherwise is either an idiot or a traitor. And frankly, uh, you might be right. <laughs> so they say, we need these special powers, and we must go in and get the bad guys. The bad guys are the people doing this. And the people here say, 
Oh, we must stop. We have made a mistake. <laughs> they say we must resist because this is not a democracy. And these people here say, what a mistake, we shouldn't have that, we should have liberal laws to allow you your place. No, they don't. <laughs> they say, we thought that we're stabbing this in the back, we're stabbing this in the front. <laughs> we must have more security. More security means this is not a democracy. And these people are <laughs> We must get out of here. They are killing us in our beds. What do you expect us to do? It's dire it's only arrow to the diagram. This is acts of extreme violence which have an enormously traumatic effect on the entire community. Because the individual victims are simply uh, proxies for the entire community. Antagonism is a relationship rooted in actual or threatened violence. Behind antagonism is a generalized fear that others intend to destroy me and my vital interests, evidenced by the activity of those threatening violence, however small in number. The result is a pervasive but fundamental distinction between friend and foe, a distinction which is treated as fact and common sense. People caught up in an antagonistic relationship cannot dismiss the possibility that the other is part of a hostile community. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> Anxiety is lessened but not eliminated by the calming rhetoric of moderates and personal relationships if the other is perceived to belong to a hostile group. But Frank Wright, the most astute analysis of the central, centrality of antagonism in Northern Ireland, puts it thus. Antagonism can said to be endemic when ethnic communities come to experience each other through the most threatening and aggravated acts of the other. Ideologies of ethnic supremacy are perception of the other as a conspiracy against which eternal vigilance is required. The need to maintain vigilance establishes a reservoir of tolerance for all means necessary, including their capacity to resort to violence just in case. By treating the conspiracy as real, we are driven to conspire ourselves. Antagonism creates a self-replicating engine of vigilance in which each act of violence promises to end violence but actually generates more violence in a pattern of reciprocity and escalation. What persists is the structure of them and us where responsibility lies firmly with them and can only be resolved by them or by victory over them. Antagonism hides the mechanism through which we are also contributory within the reciprocal cycle, raising, resisting the enemy to heroism and declaring compromise as appeasement. The heart of antagonistic conflict is the self-perpetuating dynamic of conspiracy, discrimination and terror in which everyone participates and nobody feels responsible. In a conspiratorial world, it is simply irrational to promote equality. Antagonism turns everything into a conflict to get and hold the maximum amount of resources before the rivals can get them. If inequality creates conflict, it is equally true that conflict rationalizes inequality. Once systemic inequality is rationalized as necessary for self-defense, the antagonistic pattern of citizenship becomes embedded in discrimination and resentment, institutionalizing a de facto experience of first and second class citizenship based on group divisions. Inevitably, unionists, the Protestants, explained the root of this crisis by the malevolent intentions of nationalism, whereas nationalists condemned the system of larger and smaller exclusions institutionalized in the fabric of the state. Equally, formally equal citizenship is destroyed in practice once the friend and foe dynamic is embedded in the routine practice of the state. Commitment to equal citizenship in Northern Ireland was profoundly compromised by the self-evident requirement claimed by the governing unions for protection against hostile and violent enemies. Suspicion and vigilance demand control of public institutions, securing the, the state's privilege to make laws and use force, Weber's monopoly of violence. The appearance of democratic procedures obscures the fact that this is a battle for supremacy between peoples rather than decision-making by a people. By equating victory with justice, violence is raised to the highest ethic. In the face of existential threat, war is necessarily just. The only justice is victory. By equating peace with treachery, cooperation is anathema. Internal participants present a narrative of provocation by others and reaction by us in which differences in moral responsibility are absolute. 
Outside observers, without stake in the antagonistic relationship, see a pattern of reciprocity and similarity where heroes and villains perform essentially the same acts observed from different sides of an antagonistic relationship. The gap between justice and revenge reduces to an almost indistinguishable level. Unsurprisingly, it is this insight of the equivalence of heroism and crime and the ambivalence of our categories of victim and perpetrator which provoke the greatest resistance of all. And I have to say I was really quite heartened by um, Chris's talk this morning, which is that the critical question is in maintaining the moral discipline of the soldier because the capacity of people within this context to simply descend into whatever is necessary is absolutely enormous, the pressure on people to do so. And the fact that they don't do it all the time is in many ways quite remarkable. Some of that's the really heroic stuff going on here. Political life in this setting oscillates between periods of revenge and open violence and periods of tranquility and underlying resentment. While one may be preferred to the other, it is profoundly vulnerable to changes in the balance of power and leads to an almost paranoid focus on apparently marginal changes in the inequality and inequality in these balances. Reconciliation in the frontier can be defined as a definitive end of conspiracy and its transcendence by mutual recognition and reciprocity. Reconciliation implies the end of friend and foe, an end to all threat of violence, a political system which commands legitimacy across ancient hostilities and the development of a culture of interdependent action co and cooperation in which the claims of citizens to goods and rights from the whole community are treated as personal and individual. Peace agreements which establish a new distribution of power and goods but leave hostility intact remain fragile and vulnerable to attempts to derail them by extremists, often feeling more like short-term pauses during which anxiety may actually rise. Seeking a fundamental reorientation in the pattern of friend and foe is the essential difference between letter acts, conflict transformation, and conflict management. In a context of reciprocal violence, reconciliation is therefore both necessary and inherently unlikely. Having described the underpinning relationships, I now want to examine what actually happened. One of the problems of political containment of violence is that beyond a certain point, it becomes increasingly difficult to ascertain whether the surface absence of violence represents a fundamental change or whether the surface absence represents the success of rigid containment, albeit at the cost of suppression of elements of the population. Where hostility has been contained rather than resolved, the absence of visible violence cannot be assumed to evidence the, presen the presence of democratic relationships. Campaigns about socioeconomic questions which can be treated as security threats can trigger an ethnic rather than socioeconomic chain of response at a remarkable speed. Northern Ireland proved a paradigm example of another of de Tocqueville's dictums that the regime which is destroyed by a revolution is almost always an improvement on its immediate predecessor. And experience teaches that the most critical moments for bad governments is the one which witnesses their first step towards reform. In 1968, many observers in Northern Ireland hoped that peaceful civil rights demands represented an opportunity for reform. But by 1969, issues of socioeconomic injustice, political hostility, and sectarian bitterness coalesced in confrontation on increasingly sectarian lines and transformed into fundamental questions about the legitimacy of the state. Northern Ireland was just small enough to be contained, although only through the sovereign power, Britain, putting large numbers of troops onto the streets and simultaneously exacerbating relationships between the state and its opponents. By the early 1970s, it was abundantly clear that neither Britain nor Ireland wanted drawn back into this nonsense. Neither did they want responsibility for sorting out the debris of history in Northern Ireland. Britain therefore confronted the IRA, but was keen to limit unionist demands for harsher measures, thus both angering their supporters and driving many of their opponents into direct violence. Ireland wanted to vindicate nationalism, which was its raison d'etat, without supporting terror. The messy, messy compromise was a nasty, brutal, internal war which only occasionally spilled outside its borders and which was managed with considerable financial and military resources. For those inside Northern Ireland, the result was a 30-year terror which coexisted with a functioning civil state most of the time. Provided it, not to, it did not destroy wider British and Irish strategic interests, the murder and mayhem was treated elsewhere as inevitable and policy was focused on creating what was called the acceptable level of violence. The result was enormous innovation in the practice of conflict management. Northern Ireland is a world leader in this, including peace walls, dividing communities into physical segregation and paramilitary subcultures. 
But the war, not war twilight, also allowed for the development of a number of practical experiments and intervention, which have proved to be both interesting and potentially important, including integrated education, shared policing, and lots of the intercommunity practice that we've talked about at community level. Eventually, as violence became visibly less effective, Northern Ireland be became a test case of the nature of peace building. But Northern Ireland also saw something highly unusual and a little less cynical. The bond of nationality, which characteristically strengthened when the folk is believed to be under threat by violence, actually loosened in Britain and Ireland, replaced by shared horror and widespread alienation from the violence of Northern Ireland. The partisan impulse was overwhelmed by a rejection of the tide of violence, which deeply offended post-war European post-Holocaust ethics. And that indeed is something new in international affairs. Instead of escalating interstate conflict, violent antagonism in Northern Ireland generated a gradual process of interstate rapprochement, as residual post-colonial resentment was steadily transformed into active partnership. Um, and competing claims to sovereignty and territory were subordinated and reframed within a, a dynamic narrative of reconciliation. I'm running five minutes late. Can I keep going, or do you want me to write? <laughs> I've just got my time and I'm going here. Reconciliation as a policy of state emerged with the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985, the most radical reformulation of British and Irish government approaches to Northern Ireland since 1920. It established a new orthodoxy that both containment and an end to antagonism in Northern Ireland required active interstate cooperation within a broad, if still vague, British and Irish framework and joint commitment to, in its words, peace, stability and prosperity through the island of Ireland by promoting reconciliation, respect for human rights, cooperation against terrorism and the development of economic, social and cultural cooperation. The future in Northern Ireland was to be shared and the enmity of the past replaced with friendship and partnership in the future. Another dagger. <laughs> the theory is Britain is unionist. It sets the whole thing up. And that Ireland is endlessly nationalist. Four green fields, a nation once again, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, the truth is, the British strategic interests are, we want out of there as quickly as possible. <laughs> they agree with Sinn Féin. The only thing that keeps the border there is the last thing in God's earth that the rest of Ireland wants is a united Ireland. So they're really unionists. <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, Strategically, they find huge common cause. Um, however, and they agreed, indeed the whole world agreed, they've got the European Union and the United States in here, the whole world agreed we should share. <laughs> Only they find it more difficult. Because to share in here is not simply a technical question, particularly in democracy where you must do it voluntarily. It actually means you would be killing me to become my equal. And that is what peace building devolves down to, which is, can I share on a new basis without holding what happened in the past in any way against you? Can we share together the building of a future? And I have to tell you that it's a, it's a psychological mountain to climb. Peace building, if we're serious, is absolutely not cheap grace. The emergent British-Irish partnership was undoubtedly a historic achievement. Reconciliation provided a language of peace within which traditional national and antagonistic claims that justice and liberty depended on the ex exercise of exclusive sovereignty were transcended by an ethic which established the sovereign's duty in partnership with its former enemy to ensure the rule of law as it was established in the West after the horrors of the Holocaust through human rights and equality. The internal conflict narrative of British versus Irish, Protestant versus Catholic was to be transcended by, not opposed to, a contrasting narrative of sharing over separation and reconciliation over conflict. The challenges were recast as ethical rather than national. The difficulty was that ethics of reconciliation, which were well articulated in the face of the ongoing violence, were not quite as ethical as they seemed. Reconciliation was attractive also because by 1985 it was clear that it was the only vehicle to the more prosaic strategic priority of containing the crisis. But that very fact now placed the states in an ethical standoff with their antagonistic prod prod prodigy, progeny. 
progeny. Unionists regarded the concession of a formal role for the Irish Republic as treason. Likewise, Republicans rejected the new arrangements as a nationalist nightmare, but they had to do the actual reconciliation. While managing political problems where they are present as violence, as in Northern Ireland, rather than where they originate, British-Irish relations, is far from unusual. Its problematic consequence is that where reconciliation is most necessary, it is also most difficult. Not only had the British and Irish governments qualified the doctrine of self-determination within liberalism in a way which would be entirely unacceptable to the rest of their citizenry. In other words, you all can have your own country. You can't. Uh, not only had they done that, they, but reconciliation imposed unusual risks of trust on people who have suffered directly at the hands of violence and exclusion. Those most traumatized by violence do not want or cannot countenance sharing with their abuser, while those who do not feel the risk either do not understand what is being asked and almost certainly do not want to be dragged into taking any direct responsibility. The doctrine of reconciliation gave new coherence, but it also brought with it profoundly awkward consequences. It allowed the British and Irish elites to moralize their actions obscuring the fact that the prospect of containing and limiting the unenforceable claims of exclusive nationalism to sovereignty in the ethnic frontier was also a matter of interest as well as morality. Like some magic disappearing trick, reconciliation neatly allowed sovereign government action to repudiate normal claims by their nationals for security support at the margin of the state. By limiting national solidarity, the British state and broader Irish nationalism were transformed into innocent peacemakers while the Protestants and Catholics of Northern Ireland were defined as the problem for their obtuse refusal to see ethical or political sense. The stated ethical preference for peace was indistinguishable from the real political decision that Britain and Ireland would not or could not enforce national claims by violence in the frontier. But an ethic which repudiates national violence inevitably casts an unwelcome light on collusion with violence by all parties in the past. An anti-violence ethic places the claims of victims at the centre of moral concern, exposing killing and exclusion as, at best, futile and misguided. Not only individual killers, but whole political traditions are potentially revealed as closer to criminal than heroic. In practice, while this searing exposure of violence threatened to undermine the legitimacy of every political party, gov of every political party governments and nationalists of every sort, unions included, found it convenient to move on. Without political support, the government sought to kickstart reconciliation through community and economic engagement. And I have a whole piece here just on, on, on what was done and it was extremely sophisticated, including huge distribution of grants to community organizations, the development of a very big uh, human rights and equality infrastructure, the development of the organization I worked for, the Community Relations Council, which was able to kind of pioneer the development of huge amounts of uh, actual uh, engagement in some of the most difficult questions, ranging from policing to my military decommissioning to what we're going to do about the interfaith walls and so on. Between reconciliation and political, re sorry, together these initiatives created a new momentum for political engagement. But whereas the intergovernmental, international and community narratives were of reconciliation, the concern of the antagonistic and parties in Northern Ireland remained within antagonistic assumptions to limit the cost of any deal and to maximize the advantage of any settlement. Between reconciliation and political reality, and between idealistic goals and the wish that they be delivered by others, peace finding in Northern Ireland, that's a new way of talking about it, was to be a process. At one level, at least, a euphemism for a three-ring circus seeking to give public meaning to this complexity. After a political false start in 1992, the whole thing uh, eventually developed. Almost. Ultimate, uh, sorry, and even the, the final negotiations were boycotted by a major unionist bloc. Deals were done without any direct negotiations between Republican unionists and always broke down. Ultimately, however, the sheer pressure of international commitment led to the emergence of a new deal, the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement of 1998. In many ways, this is a remarkable document, reflecting a profound commitment to reconciliation. In theory, the signatories agreed to end violence, share government, promote reconciliation, and accept equality and human rights in a spirit of partnership, equality, and mutual respect. Acknowledging that they did not share constitutional aspirations, the signatories dedicated themselves to strive in every practical way towards reconciliation within the framework of democratic and agreed 
arrangements and recognize that the tragedies of the past have left a deep, profoundly regrettable legacy of suffering. All parties gave a total and absolute commitment to exclusively democratic and peaceful means. Arguably the most radical element of the agreement was its internationally new commitment to the birthright of all the people of Northern Ireland to identify themselves and be accepted as British or Irish or both as they may choose and the confirmation that this would not be affected by any future change in the status of Northern Ireland. One of the little games you can play with Homeland Security if you come here is to change your passports. They don't know who's coming. <laughs> Irish and Irish nationalists thereby officially conceded the permanent legitimacy of a British people and culture in Ireland, while Unionists in Britain acknowledged that being Irish and seeking a united Ireland in Northern Ireland was a declaration of loyal citizenship in a shared society. But although reconciliation was central to the deal, the political infrastructure still had to accommodate unresolved antagonism. It sought to do this by distributing rather than sharing power, by explicitly leaving national aspiration intact, and by aggrieving what proved to be an ambiguous, imprecise package of measures around the most difficult issue of all, the disarmament and disbandment of paramilitaries and the establishment of shared and agreed institutions to the rule of law, the police. Furthermore, as the unchanged and primary interest of the British and Irish governments was to divest themselves of responsibility for Northern Ireland, the new settlement foresaw primary responsibility for putting reconciliation into practice in local political hands, for which can be read still suspicious, conspiratorial and antagonistic hands. The unresolved question, therefore, was which element would triumph over which. The institutions of government collapsed twice before 2003. In 2001, serious disorder broke out in Belfast, as the Community Relations Council commented. Looked at from day to day or from, respect, or from the perspective of those most directly affected by recent violence, it often appears that society if, has, if anything, become as more polarised and segregated. Banco's ghost reconciliation haunted the scene by its absence. The simple truth was that despite enormous international goodwill, reconciliation collapsed when it became the transferred responsibility of parties consumed by suspicion and hostility. When the political institutions collapsed, the dichotomy between ethical commitments to reconciliation and the obvious conclusion that there was no available leadership to sustain it in Northern Ireland forced this form of split personality. The, the effort to build a shared future was sustained by a combination of government action to establish institutions agreed in 1998, international diplomacy and community activity. Commissions for Human Rights and Equality were established. An international commission on policing was extremely successful. Community relations developed into a comprehensive intervention strategy on the Lederach model of supporting action at every level of society under the rubric of equity, diversity and interdependence. A new policy of promoting intercommunity action was developed under a title, A Shared Future after a public consultation that endorsed commitments such as separate but equal is not an option and that parallel living and the provision of parallel services are unsustainable both morally and economically. Meanwhile, massive participative international programs of support for intercommunity reconciliation were established. Reconciliation was explicitly defined within these to mean a common vision of an interdependent, just, equitable, open and diverse society and the development of a vision of a shared future requiring the involvement of everyone. And identified with five issues, and as a definition of reconciliation in practice, I think it's a good one. The development of a shared vision of an interdependent society, acknowledging and dealing with violence in the past, building positive relationships across divisions, managing significant cultural and attitudinal change, and social, economic and political change to ensure equality and equity. But the language of reconciliation obscured the fact that the political priority was containing violence. So this is these two forms of peace competing with each other now. They entailed, this entailed focusing on finding the political formula which would entice the most dangerous antagonists to share office. Paradoxically, this entailed less, em less emphasis on reconciliation. Containment on this basis appeared to be achievable. Reconciliation, while desirable, was too hard. Efforts to hold out for a transformative peace would result in practical difficulties in establishing working institutions. Peace meant an accommodation with antagonism, not an accommodation between antagonists. None of this was explicit. Reconciliation was politically recast as the terms for a political deal between antagonists, underpinned by a minimal framework which obtained what had been previously in doubt. The military strategic elements of a peace which secured the abandonment of political violence, support for the rule of law and cooperation in a shared administration. 
The wider nature of partnership was treated as negotiable. Even the most cooperative elements of the Good Friday Agreement's political structure, the Joint Office of First Minister, was redefined to prevent any misunderstanding that there was mutual regard between nationalists and unionists. Critically, there was now no requirement to redress the outstanding issues of reconciliation identified in the international programmes, such as a vision of an interdependent society dealing with the past or intercommunity relations. The symbolic significance of enemies like Paisley and McGuinness sitting side by side was undoubtedly compelling. What was obscured was that the visionary elements of the agreement, dealing with the past, as I've said, promoting shared housing and so on, had been set aside and passed over to the apparently reconciled but actually antagonistic new leadership. Reconciliation was no longer a shared vision, but, but it was the government institution itself. Since 2007, all of this has developed in a more or less con consistent manner. Executive stability and violence was and, and, and stability and the end of violence was normally possible, popular, and violence reduced markedly. But the new regime was unable or unwilling to make compromises where issues of community antagonism are concerned. A shared future was effectively shelled. Those who pointed this out or worried about the longer term implications were either ignored or treated as without mandate. Yet, meanwhile, the challenges to executive stability and violence grow. So, as 2012 has turned into 2013, serious disputes about symbolism and cultural identity have again surfaced with little evidence that the new executive has the power to address them. So, where do we go from here? Finish, and then I'll finish. I hope you'll be glad to know. Northern Ireland is not in itself important. But for me, as a citizen and as a member of its society, it raises profound challenges. It is hard to imagine more political effort or indeed financial effort being put into a small situation like ours. Furthermore, in spite of my narrative, the scale of the emotional obstacles to reconciliation which have resulted from violence are actually limited if compared to almost anywhere else which has lived through these dynamics. You need to listen to Rwanda to talk about what actually real serious suffering is about. We are not, in spite of our own telling to ourselves, the most oppressed people ever. <laughs> However, it might be useful to talk about some of the wider lessons, at least provisionally, which, which could be important to emphasize. First of all, peace in our real world requires a political order. We have to be real. We have to create rules around this, and we have to defend it. So what constitutes justice needs to be thought about really seriously, and what has been done to date in human rights, equality, and international law has given us the only normative basis on which to make change with any ethical transcendence. However, it is not enough. As the world gets smaller, contending ourselves with containing conflicts may be extremely attractive, indeed the only practical short-term option, but it is not a solution. Containment is at best temporary and increasingly so. Northern Ireland says that a politic that contents itself with limited stability does not work for those most intimately tied up with antagonism, nor does it generate a dynamic for change and is long-term unstable. At best, this kind of political peace which succeeds in limiting or containing the possibility of revenge without eliminating the poison of hostility leads to a kind of endemic gnawing resentment which cripples healthy development and continues to require disproportionate attention. Secondly, we also need to accept that reconciliation cannot be enforced. In other words, we have reached the limits of politics. We therefore require a much more serious ethical discussion about the limits which our world is imposing on our notion that war is a choice which humans have. And what that is a choice that we have is just one of the tools in the kit. And what that means for what we have to do if we want peace. This is at least as much a discussion for ethics, for faith, and for academics as it is for fighters. Although warriors very often have the advantage that they know in a much more real way what is actually at stake. Incarnation can be hoped for, prayed for, and worked for, but it cannot be legislated. The bridge between peace as theory and practice is visible and lived reality. This is what we mean by leadership, and it means, in fact, it is, remains a sine qua non. What we must begin to do is cultivate a culture and a sensitivity for the real people and the real situations which demonstrate peace, not the politically correct version of peace builders who are on one side and the other. But where do we really see something new coming into the world? In Christian terms, this is a gospel 101. But in much of the world, its meaning remains obscure. And for clarity, many of these peace leaders will not be nominal Christians, though as one, it would be wonderful if there were a few. For me, that is a huge challenge, 
for churches and faith-based institutions. Thirdly, and connected, we need to understand how difficult this is for political leaders to achieve. The truth is that embracing the enemy, however it is understood, is incredibly risky in a context where for many the justice of the war is clear. The justice of the peace is not. Political leaders who confront their own people with the necessity to find the humanity in their abuser and, the, and to find the abuser in themselves are touching the electric wire of democratic politics. Furthermore, this is true in spades for leaders who come to this conclusion when their legitimacy has arisen from their service as leaders of their people in war. Embracing the enemy is not just unwise, it is potentially betrayal. And so what we are asking for people is seriously something really quite profound. And what makes that possible is really the question for everybody else who's not sitting in the room. What, how is it made possible for people to make those kinds of leadership decisions? Finally, all of this depends on a fairly major philosophical choice, that we believe in the far side of revenge. Do we believe in it or not? Is this all worth it or is it a waste of time? In this country of optimism and whose great generation contributed so massively to the Western world's continuing belief that there are real differences between the ideologies of death in fascism and Stalinism and what America stood for. This has always been historically an easier call. But as we move into a more difficult era, when the underside of Western success, violence and domination, is shown to us so clearly, we too will be forced to rely on forgiveness and to seek reconciliation. There's work to do.